take him three months to do. 40 feet of scaffolding. These trees right here, Coast Redwood, Twin Tower Memorial trees. Look at these things. Huge. Wow. Okay, we're going. We're going. We're going. Uh, we're in Confusion Hill. All this stuff we'll check out. The non-gravity believer person, go. You can go first. You'll, you'll feel the gravity pull you right outside that fence. Stay on the path. If you don't feel gravity pulling you, something's wrong. Look how you're standing, dude. <laughs> It's pretty cool, huh? You don't feel that? Yeah. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah, it's different, huh? Look at the ball. Ball. So crazy how they build this hill. Alright, stand up. Josh, where's the water bottle? Right there. 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 Right Oh, that's kind of comfortable. Hi. 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 Oh, Wow. That's like, it's crazy feeling. This ball right here. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he said. Oh, this is pretty new. This is like uphill. Yeah. And you said it straight up. Is it uphill? I mean, look at that. Look. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's not normal. No. Don't you feel that gravity pull? Step out the yeah, door. I feel going. Step out the door yeah. and, you'll, and you'll stop feeling it. And then you'll feel it pull you back in. Step closer and you'll feel it pull you. Right. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't think it's gravity. Step back in and you can feel it pull you. Can you not feel that? Yeah, I don't. It's not gravity, though. Oh, my God. They don't have gravity. The US these are these are people that are saying gravity exists. Okay, listen. Do you see the angle of this building? Do you see the angle You're standing on a hill like that. to accommodate for the to make myself right, level on the hill. This is not normal. Whoa, dude! How can you do that? Right. Look. <laughs> She's all. Hey, he did it backwards over this there. Is not normal. Show backwards. That's so crazy. Look at it, I swear. It's only like it's pulling you that way. It is. Shoot. It is. All right, you can just bend like I that. can't do this in real life outside of the house. And how do you house. explain that? Try to do that right here. I can't.
can. Go out here. Okay, look. <laughs> no, it's not going to work, dude. Oh, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> We're headed up to the train ride. Over the top of Confusion Hill. That was a pretty crazy place, this little room right here. We'll go down and look at some more though. Water running uphill. We'll be back. They have literally every kind of chainsaw that can be created. Have any of y'all been on this ride before? Okay, so a couple of you do. A couple of you know we use an Alpine switchback system to get up to the top of the hill. That means we go forward, backwards, forwards, backwards, forwards, backwards. Gets monotonous after a bit. You didn't know you paid for a ride to go back and forth until we hit the top and then turn around and come right back down, huh? Yeah, we'll try to make it fun on the way up or down. Now, on the way up and down this on this ride keep your eyes open you never know what you'll see on this ride uh, several rides in the past we've seen doe and buck uh, fawns um, just all kinds of deer here the last few couple weeks I don't know what's going on but they're starting to come through here I know during hunting season you won't see a one here you want to see a deer during hunting season you go to the state parks they're all over the place there uh, also, quick warning, don't reach out and grab any bushes or branches. You never know what's sitting on that bush or branch. I hit a bush last year with my elbow because I have to have it out to switch the track direction. And unfortunately, sitting on a fern was a bee. I hit him once, he tagged me twice. Very unpleasant. Now, uh, this is a diesel engine, so at some point you're probably going to smell diesel smoke. It's just the nature of the beast. And hopefully nobody's afraid of heights. Nobody? Cool. If you were, the best I could do would be to say, look at the bank, cover your eyes. Help. Yeah, that's how a lot of people have done it. <laughs> I gotta build up air pressure. It's important for two different things on this ride. And I have varying opinions as to which one is the most important. One is the whistle, and the other one's the brakes. So like I said, some people think brakes are important, others think the whistle's important. The whistle's need, important to me. You need the whistle if the brakes go out though. <laughs> That was amazing. That was awesome. Now we begin the exercise portion. This is where you this guys where we get walk. To walk up the second switch. I'll meet you in about a half hour. <laughs> ha ha ha. There's 
the track we came off of. That's pretty cool how they have it set up, huh? Saw right here in front of the foreground right here it looks makes the most sense the flat blade so like back that in the 1800s when they started logging the hill growth they didn't have the luxury of chainsaws like we know them they were using high-tech equipment for the time that probably be the double bit axe and a misery whip now as you can expect it takes several days to take one of the big trees down with something like that and a whole lot of shoulder muscle now the misery whip that's an appropriate name for that particular piece of equipment because if you're not in perfect sync with the other person, that thing's flat misery getting it to do anything but get stuck. I know I've played with them trying to cut these logs. They just don't work. Now, however, if you know what you're doing with one of these things, you can do pretty good. Uh, seen it on logging competition shows. They'll take a log about this big around, and two old boys that know what they're doing with the misery whip can cut that log almost as fast as a regular chainsaw. So that's flat getting after it. That's great. Now, back in the old days, the logging competition guys didn't have the added attraction that the old timers did. The old timers used kerosene as a lubricant on the blade. So as they're cutting, they're splashing kerosene on to make it slide easier through the cut. So by the end of the day, they were doing their best impersonation of a, well, a hurricane lantern, most likely. <laughs> Hopefully nobody lit them on fire. <coughs> 
Now they say the first chainsaw is this 1910 drag saw. Well, I don't know about y'all, but I don't see a chainsaw. What I see is a misery whip on steroids. <laughs> I mean, it ain't got people no more, it's got a motor. Right. And ain't no chain cutting the wood. So I don't consider that a chainsaw. Now the other saws up on the bank here, most of the saws are 20s through the 60s. They still had some pretty heavy motors back then. <clears throat> so a few of these, once you put a four foot or six foot bar up on it, and you grab it and throw it up over your shoulder to go hiking up down the hills, you just put about 50 pounds on your shoulder. Then you gotta add wedges, which they didn't use plastic back then, it was all steel, axe, fuel, and then important stuff like food and water. So once you got all that stuff together, you got about 60 or 70 pounds and you're packing up down these hills hiking. Wow. These hills are a trip on their own without all the extra gear. <clears throat> so now once you got these things cut, you had to have a way to get them up to a flat or a landing. So in 1898, the steam powered yard or steam donkey was the critter for the job. Now I look at this thing, I see heavy. I can tell you this thing weighs right around 14,000 pounds Ooh. as it sits. That's seven tons. Now, this thing probably took about 10 oxen to drag it up the hill because they didn't put wheels under it. They just hooked a team of oxen on, said mush, wow. and away they went. Now, keep in mind, this is a baby version of the steam donkey. There are steam donkeys out there that are almost the size of a house. Now those, I can only guess how many oxen it would take on that. But I'm betting it would have been an impressive sight to see 40 or 50 oxen dragging a house-sized object up the side of the hill. Shoot That'd you. be a trip wow. to see. Now once you had this thing in location where you're gonna work from, how do you communicate with your cutter or your choker setter? They're a half mile down the hill. Well, back then they'd hire a young man to climb way up in the tree. His job title was whistle punk. His job was to watch a choker setter, this being a choker. This is what they put around the log or logs to drag them up the hill. Now once the guy was satisfied this thing was latched, everybody was out of the way, he'd contact the whistle punk. The whistle punk contacted these guys, they started dragging. Now I'm guessing at some point, maybe the whistle punk wasn't doing his job good enough, or they just wanted to move on with technology. They got rid of the whistle punk and used air horns for quite a few years. Now a guy tells me this year that they carry a box on their hip, they push a button on it, it registers the noise up in the cab of the yard and tells them it's safe to pull. He said there's also a walkie-talkie integrated into the system. Modern technology is great if it works right. <clears throat> now, personally, I think they could have come up with a better name for that piece of logging equipment because talkie tutor, just don't get it. That sounds like a two-year-old's toy, not a piece of logging equipment. And a guy explained it to me. He said, well, you can talk on it. It's okay to talk. He, he said, well, when you push the button, it makes a toot noise up in the cab. Okay, talk I'll give it to him on that one. <laughs> now, move forward a few years, 1923, you have the gasoline tire yard down on the end. Then you move forward a couple of years to the 1930s, you got the Buddha diesel yarder. I don't know in that time frame if they decided or discovered, maybe, that a large gasoline-powered motor out in the woods might not have been a good idea. Gasoline has this nasty habit of blowing up, catching fire, and all that stuff. For diesel, the biggest downside to diesel is it stinks. Now, me personally, I put up the smell of diesel over a fire any day of the week. You know, from now, what I understand nowadays, they pull this huge truck up on location, stand the mast up, anchor out, and they're pulling timber in a fraction of the time it would take to get these things up on location and set up. So it just takes them that long to do it now. You got a heart-shaped log right there. See it? Almost dropped the phone that. Back down the hill. Oh no, not back down the hill. There's the track we came in on. Going through the smoke stack. <laughs> I know that when we 
started the season Memorial Weekend, we had two inches of clearance above this calf. I can tell you right now, there's nowhere near two inches. Wow. I just figured. Wow. Now, nobody's afraid of spiders, right? <laughs> well, if you are, don't look up in here. And if you do look up in here, don't show any fear and it won't attack. You show fear and this thing will attack. That's why I got a lid over me. <laughs> between 100 and 600 years old. Now, the Coast Redwood is considered to be the tallest living thing in the world. As of 06, the record is 379 feet, one inch. Wow. That's reaching way up into the sky. Now, with these things being the tallest living things, how big would you expect a pine cone to be? Big, tall, skinny thing? Big, tall, fat thing? Short, fat? Well, if you answered on any of those, you'd have been wrong. That is a redwood pine cone. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's as big as they get. Oh, my God. Now, I can tell you that the seeds, when this thing opens up and drops the seeds to the forest floor, those seeds aren't going to grow a tree. They're just basically food. There's only one way that those seeds will be viable for growing, and that is if the critters miss it and you have a forest fire come through the area because these seeds have to be fire cracked before wow. they're viable to grow. Most of the time, redwoods reproduce just like that. Something happened to the parent tree, and I'm guessing it was lightning yeah. and fire probably took lightning the parent took out. And I'm guessing tree. again that it was probably 200 plus years ago because the age of the family group around it. Most of the time, the family group won't come up around the parent until something happens to it. Because you look in an old growth grove, there's very little grows down in the bottom because there's no sunlight. Well, once the parent goes down, then you got this big gaping hole where it was and where it took out other trees all the way through. Then they can start growing up. You'll see little sprouts around the parent most of the time and they'll die off pretty quick. But once the sun gets in there, you wind up with family groups like that because they're coming off the roots of the parent. That's pretty cool. Now up ahead, we have some 20 plus year old family groups and we know they're 20 plus. The area up here was harvested in 1993. So that puts them a little over 20 years old. So we know we can, I can guesstimate since knowing the size of those and the size of these, that's why I guesstimate what I do on it. Pretty cool. in there. Saw. How do you get his hands on a couple of those? Awesome. 27 fire truck right there was probably a pretty nice rig Drag when it off. came out on the road, except for what I consider a drawback. Now, that drawback is what it has in common with the Skaggy Yarder, the Booty Yarder, and this 1935 35 bulldozer over my shoulder. And that's how you get to start that piece of equipment. There's no battery or key to this thing. That hand crank on the front bumper is how you get to start all those pieces of equipment. You shake hands with that until it fires over. I'll bet they made the new guy on the crew do it in the wintertime. That's crazy. A lot of people oh. wound up with what they called was a chauffeur's brake. Their hand would get broken from either the kickback when it backfired uh. and kicked or when your hand slipped off and hit the ground. 
The babies go right around the parent tree. They're babies. It's pretty cool. Uh, I think we're doing something wrong here. Uh, train. Apparently a tree fell on it in 1995. Okay, so 1955, when they put this train right in, this was the engine. This is what pulled you up and down the hill. No, we didn't hit a tree. What it was is when they took the old growth out in 93, they took away all the wind breaks. Consequently, the first good windstorm we had, which happened to be 1995, they lost 80 plus trees up here in this flat. Wow. That's a fairly small flat for that many trees to go down. Yeah. Now, nobody was too broken hearted over the fact that this thing got wrinkled. Everybody I ever talked to that ever operated said this was one of the most cantankerous pieces of junk you'd ever want to try <laughs> to operate. Part of the reason was you had to crawl down inside the hatch to operate the thing. And then when the brakes failed, you had to jump out real fast and throw a four by four between the wheels to stop it. Oh my God. Sounds a little sketchy. Right. Now, they even toyed with a grappling hook one time, from what I was told. They thought their idea was, well, they lose the brakes, they throw the hook out, it hooks a tie and stops them. What they didn't figure into that equation was the weight of this train in motion. So they threw the hook out, it hooked one time, and ripped eight out. Oh, so they wow. did fix the idea real quick and went on back to their four by four idea. Now, me personally, I'm glad I never had the privilege of operating this thing for a couple reasons. One, again, you got to crawl down that hatch to operate the thing. And I got thinking about me being a fat boy trying to jump out of this thing and quickly throw a 4x4 four four and it just sounded like it would end badly all the way around. So I'm fine with not having to operate this. The other is motors up front, you're in back. Most vehicles have a barrier between you and the motor. 
On a car, it's called a firewall. On this thing, it's called non-existent. So all the heat will build up and come back to the operator oh, different God. parts during the ride. That'd make it a warm ride. Yeah. Now, RIP. <laughs> that typically means rest in peace. As far as Chet, Tony, and Doug were concerned, there was no way on God's green earth that they could want this thing to rest in peace. So their spin on RIP is rust in place. Uh, <laughs> rust in place. Ooh, it's long. Right here it is. side says no taproot. What that's referring to is the fact that redwood trees don't have a taproot like the oak, the fir, madrone, maple. They all have a taproot. The taproot is simple. It's one root that goes deep into the ground. That's what anchors the tree in place. Well, since the redwood doesn't have one of those, the deepest you'll see the root mass on the redwoods is between six and nine feet deep. Now, that's pretty shallow for as big as these trees are. You'd expect yeah. them to blow over a lot more often than they do. Well, they got a few tricks up their bark to get around that. One of them is, if that tree's 100 feet tall, the roots go out over 100 feet in all directions. Oh, wow. If the tree's 300 feet tall, the roots are out 300 in all directions. Wow. It also helps that they hold hands underground. So if one goes to lean a little bit, the others can kind of pull it back into spot. Now, obviously, it doesn't work every time, but it works well enough that we have one and two thousand year old trees up in this part of the world. Now I had a lady on here last year from the forestry department. She was telling us that if this tree had a good source of water and it was doing well, and one of those trees back over there wasn't doing as good, this tree can transfer water to the other one through the root system. Wow. It can also transfer the nutrients from photosynthesis to the other tree if it needs it. Makes it pretty special on how they grow. They're a team, team effort. Woo. The redwoods are amazing. Thank you.